welcome. This is your is it second gig in Toronto? You played a few years ago. Uh, at, yeah, I actually came here and played. And you played at Sound Emporium. Yeah, that's West, it. Yeah, yeah, which is kind of funny. That was a really good gig, actually. Because um, if you look back a year and a half ago, that's where I met Phil and Perry, and that was their very first gig. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. So that was the first time they ever played outside of New York City. They're Canadian guys, right? They're from New York City. New York City. They have a residency here in a club just north of okay. Toronto. So and they're here all the time and very good friends. And so on. So, um, so how was your night last night? What did was, you get to see? It was really good, actually. Yeah, I mean, we played at Plush in Vancouver. Um, it was pretty packed out. We played after BT, and it worked really well, I think, because what BT was playing really led well into our stuff. Yeah. Um, he was playing slightly more warm-up material than I expected, uh, though he did play the uh, Tiesto track he sang on, so <laughs> that was a bit more banging yeah. than I expected in some ways as well. So. Looking at him in the sense of what he's done in the last little while and brought forth new steps, yeah. um, do you see anyone else other than him that's really picking up the pace and stepping up? I think technically BT is one of the most amazing producers because, um, I mean, he pioneered that whole stutter editing thing, which loads of people try to copy, but he's the master of it, isn't he, really? Um, I don't know, really. I really look up to people like Remy and Klinkenberg and those boys, they it's obviously it's like different stuff, but I really like the way they're sort of developing the sort of tech here and trying. It's really yeah, that's really cool. It's sort of it's a bit more simplistic sounding, but it really works in the club. I mean, yeah. on the one hand, you've got BT stuff, which personally for me isn't so clubby. It's that kind of Remy, Ronan Klinkerberg stuff. That's more the stuff I like to listen to at home. And then you've got yeah, the out and out club stuff, which is still technically great, but not in a kind of um, you know it's not necessarily quite so difficult to make, if you see what I mean, technically, but it's still clever because it achieves what it should do on the dance floor. And what do you guys use to produce with? We mainly use Logic. Um, we use Ableton Live as well. Uh, it's a, I mean, Ableton's a great program, and that's the program that everyone's buzzing about at the moment, obviously. Um, but our main sort of hub is Logic, and we've been using that for, well, yeah. eight or nine years or something ridiculous. I mean, I used to use it on a PC when it was at version 2 years ago. <laughs> It was pretty rocky in those days, and the MIDI timing wasn't as, as solid and stuff like that. But um, yeah, Logic's our main thing, and we use stuff like uh, Universal Audio UAD1 card, which has some great emulations of like really old compressors and techy stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> and I think what's been interesting to see recently is the, you know, with Reason, all, you know, like all these computers that there's so many producers now just doing tracks on just the computer. What we kind of found that we went that way. And now we're sort of getting back into the analog world and, and trying to use just old classic analog scenes and stuff. <laughs> you grow up and you're moving back to the more analog sound. Yeah. Or like a yeah, trying to do a hybrid of, of like real instruments with BSTs and all that. So That's what I was gonna say, is um, I mean basically we're sound quality freaks and we really like everything sound really great and to us a lot of the records that are made in Reason have got some great ideas and there's some kids making great records on Reason and there's been some really, really good ones made on it, but I have to say that the overall sound that Reason gives isn't necessarily that great. Um, it's really beneficial to then bounce each track down and mix it in something like Steinberg Nuendo, for example, which I think a lot of people are doing now. Yeah. Um, but for us, yeah, we're, we're quite into our sound quality, and it sometimes puts us off a record if it sounds like it's being made on a laptop. But I, I mean, I like using a laptop, but <laughs> yeah. And we've done tracks on the laptop. Well. We've done yeah. tracks on the laptop. I remember we reading about, them off in the studio. I remember reading about how gravity was apparently hatched. Yeah. You know, I actually, I remember what I did when I first bought my Apple G4, and I just had to see if you could make a track on it. And yeah, you can. <laughs> you did. But yeah, I mean, the best sound still comes from using a, a studio. I mean, it's also to do with monitoring and stuff like that as well. But um, you can't beat having a few bits of hardware around. I mean, people get great results from software only as well. But for us, our best results come when we use hardware and software because it gives you a more organic sound. And I don't think that's going to change for some time because um, if you do something in the computer, it's never been in the real world. Whereas if you play a synth, it's going to go through a preamp, which is going to give it a coloration. And then you record it in through an AD converter, which colors it again. And then you maybe run it through some plugins in the computer, which you can obviously do with Reason as well. But they're all sta different stages. and if you do everything just inside the computer, you're missing that outside world stage, you know, someone singing or 
an analog synth is more of an instrument, I feel, sometimes, than a soft synth. And I think there being three of us, although there's just two of us here tonight, but uh, <laughs> um, they also, you know, one person can only use the computer at the same time, but whereas, you know, somebody might be jamming, doing some drum loops and stuff, the other guys can do some, you know, pad ideas and, or bass lines and stuff. So it's more like a jamming environment, I think, the way we write. So. Sometimes people are quite surprised, because um, when we worked on the IU mix, it was a real, like, jam session. We had the drums rolling away there, and we were, like, fiddling on all our synths and stuff, and, like, jamming it out. Yeah, it was and more we really like... got a vibe, and I think you can hear that in that record, because yeah. it's, it's, it's a record which a lot of people have used as a reference point. And it kind of gets boring for us when we get sent a record that starts just like the IU mix. It's like, oh, not another one. <laughs> We're always looking for the next different thing and the next good thing. But, um, but yeah, that was a record that we really jammed out and we wouldn't have been able to do had we just used Reason or Able to Live on our own and just sitting in the screen. <laughs> but I think, you know, everybody's got different ways of working. Yeah. That's the way it's There's no right or wrong, us. but for us, that's our personal preferred way of combining technology old and new, really. From when you started off, has there been a key, um, either piece of hardware or software, that has really changed your sound, evolved your sound? And um, where would you be today if you didn't have the combination of software and hardware? It's interesting because, I, I mean, I think about this in terms of I, I feel lucky to have bought certain bits of equipment that I bought because I was able to achieve what I could on them at the time. Um, like, for example, my first synthesizer, my first proper synthesizer was a Yamaha SY5. And I could have bought a Korg and, or anything else, but the great thing about the SY5 is that you could load samples into it, and you could, it had resonant filters, which the Korgs didn't have. So it lent itself to dance music, and I was really into like Jean-Michel Jarre and the Petra Boys, New Order, all that kind of electronic sound stuff, Depeche Mode. So I was able to recreate some of those sorts of sounds, and um, that's, you know, that was a really important thing. So I think, yeah, particular bits of equipment are very important in that respect. Um, you know, a lot of people say it's not about the gear, it's what you do with it, but if you buy the wrong bit of gear, then <laughs> you're kind of screwed in a way. To your great but I think um, Tony and you and me have all been doing this for so long that we were already doing dance music before any of this kind of software stuff was happening. And uh, it was like a real revolution to discover that you could actually, you know, record audio into the computer. It was yeah, that was so great. amazing, you know, on the Amiga. And it actually, it actually made things more organic again because instead of sequencing like an analog synth, you just play it live, and that's what we do. Often we'll play in a riff live off the analog synth. Why, why use MIDI when you can play it in live and it's just a bit more? Yeah. You can always quantize it up using scissors and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> now you can. But I remember doing like, you know, when samplers were arriving and oh, gotcha. I was doing vocals and having, having vocals. to pitch bending them and you know spinning it. Up and down, like oh, so that the, it's going to stay in time because you've corrected some pitch and all, and all that kind of stuff. It's good to have but, been there, but there's no going back yeah. to that. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Yeah. So, what do you see then in the progression of people moving to stuff like Ableton, the new new releases coming out in just a little while? <clears throat> Where do you see music going from here? I mean, I guess like in terms of DJs, DJs are going to be able to get more and more involved than they already are in the records. I mean, even the CDJ 1000s enabled that to some degree. I mean, it's a bit overrated how people can say, oh, you know, the DJ is now the producer with the CDJ 1000, because he's not really. Um, but, you know, the more features and stuff that you add to Ableton, I'm sure that, you know, there's going to come a point where mixes are delivered with separate parts so that DJs can remix them live and stuff like that. There's going to be some demand for that. Um, you know, if you look at, I mean, Paul Van Dyke was one of the first person, uh, people to do sort of re-edits of tracks, um, you know, layering his own drums underneath the track. We, we sometimes do things like that or edit the length of tracks. Um, but there's going to be more scope to do more of that kind of thing as the world goes more digital because everything's going to be with an audio yeah, track. Don't you, don't you think, though, if you look back like sort of a few years ago when the VST instruments were sort of arriving, I think a lot of uh, producers all had the same tools, so everybody was kind of using the same set of instruments. And now what's happening is that computers are getting more powerful, there's a lot more software out there, mm -hmm. and a lot of people are doing what we're doing, which is then mixing that out with, you know, with the really old stuff as well. And mm -hmm. uh, a lot I of think, people are changing I think, that you know, well. that when trance music was sort of getting started, and electronic music was getting started, people had lots of different pieces of equipment, so every record had a very sort of unique sound to it. And then as the VST thing kind of <laughs> happened, I think 
everything kind of merged into this kind of similar Everyone had kind of PS1 style. in Logic, everyone yeah. had, you know, the certain synths that everyone had. But now it's, it's, it's kind of, that's why I think music's really been good recently, because people are starting to really learn how to use it and make the most of it, and there's a lot more out there for people to use as well. So. And I think software piracy played a big part in that standardization, which I don't think is necessarily a good thing, because um, yeah. it's, I think, you know, it's great that kids get to play with these things, download them off the internet and try them out, but when everyone can have access to those tools, then they end up using them and it all sounds the same, so it can be quite a negative thing in a way. Yeah. Well, um, leading into that, uh, we hear how you've got your separations and sounds just where everything's progressing. Yeah. Um, you just uh, found a new label with an upcoming release, that's Larry Mountains 54, the new yeah, David yeah. West. Um, Osgood Khan's also there. exactly Osgood Khan's co. Uh, That's fantastic. Your, um, He's a guy in, in, in software. <laughs> and we actually just um, just spoke to a fellow named Laurent Veronias. He's actually Airwave, who uh, actually yeah. says it, say hello, Pablo. Oh. Um, <laughs> but um, that being said, now that we have Anjuna Beats as a label and we have Anjuna Deep um, as a sub label of sorts, uh, yeah. we even have the oft unmentioned Hard On. <laughs> yeah, people actually, st which well, is it's still kind of, it's kind of defunct. It's sort of limp now. Just <laughs> not not quite so hard on. But uh, the question is this: Then uh, where do you really see Anjuna Beats? And by that uh, by that level, where do you see um, Anjuna Deep? Anjuna Deep. Well, where think, do you see them progressing? I think we, the sort of sound that we play, um, mm. is actually quite wide from the sort of proggy and to mm. techy stuff to trance, and we hit the a point where we've been send so much good stuff that we can't actually. Re we can't find the time to release it because we don't want to just put out too many tracks um, on the main label. So because we want to keep the quality consistent as well. Um, and I think at the moment there's been a lot of very good progressive stuff stuff that we've been sent. Some of it's so proggy that we might not necessarily want to put it on. We might sort of alienate beats. the original people who buy yeah. Angina Beats releases because one of the great things about Angina Beats is people buy some of the releases or some people do, which is nice. Like, they buy them blind, which is great. I mean that's kind of what we've always wanted to achieve is have a label that you know people can trust and yeah. they'll go into record shop without hearing it take it buy it and enjoy it and that's you know that's kind of one of our goals and to some extent we've achieved that and hopefully we can do the same with Anjuna Deep yeah. um, in the more progressive market as well but you know we're keen not to just do straight down the line prog it's you know it's quite an open vibe there you know whatever anyone sends yeah. through it it's sort of slightly deeper We'll give it a listen. <laughs> Two quick questions. Sure. One is, where do you see online downloading through purchasing? Beatport, your website, yeah, stuff like that. Where do you see, how important is that to the future of music? It's very important. Um, I think the one issue at the moment that's holding things back is the payment systems because um, traditionally the singles market was sort of mainly bought by, say, I don't know, Eight to eighteen-year-olds, or whatever, and not all of those people have a credit card. So, it's, you know, they have to use their parents' credit cards on these sites and stuff like that. So it's not ideal. So you're kind of missing out on a lot of the potential market at the moment. Once mobile phone payments are completely set up and standardised, I think um, that's when the thing will really, really take off. Yeah, because I, I mean, if you're buying albums, it's slightly different. It's a different audience. They normally have credit cards. And I kind of think that the the way that you know you're doing it from Anjunabeats.com or Beatport or other sites, it's it's kind of a you know the first stage of it. But we're anyway going to see a massive integration of all sorts of digital technologies, and, and the mm. internet's going to go everywhere, and there's going to be just new ways of getting it. And eventually, it's probably going to be that you go and play at the government, and it's all hooked up to the internet, and you just pick the tracks you want to play, and there you go. <laughs> yeah, live playlist. Yeah. I have like um, what's the word? What's that code? ISRC codes on the CDs, and it'll just display the track title for you on the screen somewhere. That'd be great. Cool. <laughs> and uh, finally, last question: um, Your opinions on Feel and Perry, where they're going in the future? Um, to be honest, I don't know that much of their stuff. Um, yeah. We've played some of their releases on Trance around the world, and they seem to be like. I mean, everyone talks about Feel and Perry, yeah. um, but we're, it's difficult to keep on top of it all sometimes. So. No problem. Excellent, Barry. Very good. Thank you. Hi, this is Above and Beyond. You're listening to DJ Am on Amplified Radio. Do you want to do one as well? Okay. <laughs> Hi, this is Pablo from. Un well, what am I going to say? <laughs> Hi, this is Pablo from Above and Beyond. You're listening to DJ Amp on. Some 
No, I can't remember. I've fried my bread. Let's do much. one. Uh, you yeah. just say hi to Spiro, I'll say hi to Johnny, and then we'll finish it off. It's, uh, yeah, you finish it off because you, you. Yeah, that's what I mean. So you say hi. <laughs> hi, this is Pavo. Hi, this is Johnny, and you're listening to DJ Amps on Amplified Radio.